Hey, everybody, it's Carter, and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series where I get to sit down with other writers and hear their fascinating stories. Um, before we get to today's guest, just a note that uh, you can hop on over to unboundwriter.com, my writing company, Unbound Writer, and check out our offerings there, uh, online classes, and we have one on one coaching, and we will be scheduling more retreats for 2025. So make sure to check that out at unboundwriter.com. So today on the show, I have, I had a travel blogger. So, you know, this show, we talk to everybody. We talk to writers of all different backgrounds, writing all different types of things. Uh, and, but I think Jen Ruiz, who was my guest today is the first travel blogger that I've had on the show. Um, she is actually a lawyer turned travel blogger, and she's a three-time TEDx speaker and a two-time reader reader's favorite award winner. And, um, she's been featured by the Washington post, Huffington post, ABC news, um, elite daily, and just has really made some inroads. And she's got a, she's got a fascinating story that you know, we went into a couple subjects pretty deeply in this in this uh, interview, but she practiced law for five years, and then she kind of had like at the end of her time as as a lawyer, she kind of had this self um, uh, self committed uh, experiment where she was going to travel. Um, she wanted to take one trip a month, basically, and it ended up being 20 trips, uh, but one trip a month for a year. Uh, so trying to figure that out with her work commitments, uh, but just kind of she was reaching the age of 30 and she was feeling the weight of societal expectations about women who are turning 30. Um, and she decided to just travel and write about her experiences, experiences with that. Um, and that culminated in um, a book that she wrote called 12 Trips in 12 Months. And that's one of several books that she has, um, but this is probably the one um, that kind of started it all. And, and, and she, so it ultimately led her to create um, the travel blog, uh, Jen on a Jet Plane, which has got you know, nearly 50,000 followers on Instagram. And so she's really kind of developed a brand around writing about her experiences um, traveling and writing uh, you know, a, mem a memoir. So, but we, it was just it, one of the, one of the things that we really dove into deeply into this episode was the idea of, first of all, internet hatred, um, which is just my, you know, it's, it's a cliche because we, 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 we know about trolls on the internet. We've known about trolls have existed as long as trolls have existed. Uh, but it's still, it's a fascinating topic to me, the idea that you can write something um, very safe and very maybe basic and simple and thoughtful. And once it goes viral, if it goes viral, a lot of people will hate you with absolutely no reason. And just talking to her about navigating navigating that anger on the internet was a really interesting um, subject. And we also kind of dove into sensitivity readers. Um, you know, you're writing about your experiences, you know, traveling through different cultures. You, you, most publishers, you know, if you are introducing the idea that you are writing about other cultures, even if it's from your own viewpoint, because you traveled there, will have sensitivity readers, a, a team, just to make sure you know, you're using the right words, you're, you're, you're calling groups by the, the, the preferred names, um, which, you know, and we know that that can try and change all the time. So we went into that a little bit as well. So she was, she was really, really fascinating. And then we um, did a great little making it up at the end. Um, she, she went light with it when I was going to go murderous and uh, she made me a better person because of it. So thank you, Jen. Uh, you're going to like this one, folks. This is my conversation with Jen Ruiz. I know that you travel a lot, so where are you today? Today you caught me at home in St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> okay, sounds good. And then you, do you spend much time there or not really? I have not been here for the last four months. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the life of a travel blogger. <laughs> so listen, so we've, I've never had a travel blogger on the show before. And so just to set 
expect so what we we talk a lot about just writing and i want to talk to you about writing and you and where when you started writing and things like that but i also want to talk about your travels because who doesn't love travel i know i certainly do as well and, and just get some insights on that and then um and at the end we do a, a make up storytelling if you're prepared for that i don't know if you saw that in the the initial emails or not I did. I don't know if I can prepare fully, so I was just going to go there's, with it. There's no way to prepare. It's a complete <laughs> mess. <laughs> I don't prepare. You don't prepare, and we just look stupid together. So it'll be great. I promise you. It'll be. It'll, it'll be easy. Okay. Um, so are you? Are you from Florida? Uh, I'm from Puerto Rico originally. Okay. When did you um, uh, move to Florida? Like as a kid, or as a kid, and then just recently, a year ago, where I was living in Puerto Rico for the last three years. Okay. Okay. Um, what were you, I'm, I'm always curious about like family life. What were your parents doing? Where did kind of your inspiration for either writing or creativity kind of come from? Did you evidence any of that when you were a kid or, or were you, uh, were you weird or were you normal is what I'm asking? <laughs> uh, I think that I, had a lot of the storyteller gene from early on. I, my mother was a teacher. And so she oh, really okay. helped me, you know, appreciate both the storyteller and the traveler gene because we would do travels in Pennsylvania, uh, rurally there, like, you know, Amish country, the Frank Lloyd mm -hmm. Wright house, uh, things like that. And so I saw from early on that you could travel without going super far. Uh, right. And that also there were stories to be told in all these places. And I grew up in libraries because I was in Philadelphia. And so it wasn't necessarily safe for me to walk home. And so I would wait in the library for my mom to come and pick me up, you know, a few hours later. So I had every single day, you know, growing up for years, three hours or more that I spent in a library. So a library really became my safe space. It yeah. became a, a way that I, yeah, I love them. And I still find them to, throughout the world today. Yeah, and that's fascinating because, you know, and this is a common thread when I talk to a lot of different writers is, you know, I was always in the library, but I never really thought about it. But you, you know, you, your reason for being in a library, at least initially, was, as you said, a safe space. And, and that's super intriguing, right? Because that's that also, I think, probably implants something in your brain, and some kind of an association. So, you know, you weren't necessarily there initially just to read books, but you're like, I'm safe. And now you have that association of safety with the library, which, which is pretty cool. Absolutely. Safety, comfort, familiarity, any kind of library around the world evokes that same feeling in me. And it yeah. is, it's really nice to have a place like that, that, you know, you can trust and libraries are those places. I think that's why yeah. they're so important. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, and when you were spending all this time as a kid in library, waiting to be picked up, were you, do you have memories of like, I, I always like gravitated towards these kind of books, I would pick one up and read for a few hours and put it back or what, just anything. I did always enjoy women's stories. So mm -hmm. Amelia Bedelia was a favorite of mine, that <laughs> series, because um, she was clumsy but lovable. And, you know, right. her heart was always in the right place. Relatable. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, all of the, uh, like, American Girl doll stories, because they mm -hmm. each had stories that accompanied them. And then similar historical fiction novels, but with, like, you know, these teenage girls as the uh, heroes in the stories where I really saw myself reflected in those characters. And I think to this mm. day, you know, my style has grown with me where I like to see characters that mimic where I'm at now in life uh, in the books that I'm reading and writing. And so I think that it grows with you as you go and you discover these new stages of life that really need to be explored and have a voice given to them. Um, but yeah, as a kid, I really related to those stories. Yeah. And I think that's that makes sense across whatever it is you're writing people want to see themselves in whomever they're reading about whether it could be a memoir it could be nonfiction and fiction whatever and because you are constantly saying what would i do in this situation or i totally have done things just like that um and when it becomes unrelatable it's a little bit you know that can be great too but that becomes a little bit more difficult to uh, to care about the character i think when it's like that so you were obviously gravitating to characters who uh who who kind of spoke to you obviously 
And I think that's why we have elements like love triangles and these supernatural stories about vampires and things, right? So if you can't relate because you're not a vampire, you can relate to that theme of like, you know, the love triangle, this unrequited love, all of these themes that still take place in that unknown. Right. They're always they're always like human elements, regardless of it could be from the <laughs> from the point of view of a cat. And, and you know, you could relate to it because they <laughs> anthropomorphize it. Um, so did you start having thoughts about like, I want to, you know, either get into writing or do something travel related? I want to study this further. Um, what was that kind of uh, education path like? So I always enjoyed writing. I was always in advanced classes, you know, from early on, I would get taken out of uh, lessons for a day and be put in just a dedicated reader class. So I mm. remember being like, in first grade and analyzing little women with like a select group of five other students, hmm. you know, and things like that. Yeah. So already I, you know, reading wise, I was always a very avid reader and it was not necessarily in my head to become an author, but I knew that that was going to be a part in the career that I chose. And so when I got to college, I was a poli science major, but I actually took English as a minor because I wanted to know more about literature. I wanted to just take classes like, you know, the fun elective classes that people take. Like for me, that was poetry where I was like, this maybe mm. doesn't have any practical application, but I want to learn about poetry from this really fantastic instructor uh, right. who's really passionate about it. And so uh, that was something that I still nurtured, even though I wasn't really sure where it was going. And then when I had a career in law, definitely reading, writing that comprehension was a, a skill set. And it was something that served me well. But I was missing that element of just the fun storytelling of being able to have a creative outlet in my writing. And so that's when I started pitching uh, articles to different media outlets to publish and also launched my own blog. Okay, so so you went to law school. Um, sounds like, um, right. And you're right. Storytelling in legal briefs is not as easy to necessarily, um, shine through, uh, where, where did you go to law school? I, and I asked because my daughter's applying to law schools right now. So I'm, I'm curious. Yes. I went to university of Maryland. Okay. Okay. And then, and then you're in law school and what are you thinking about doing? I, I know you're thinking I want to apply all these skills, but clearly you're going to go into some realm of legal field at, at that point in time. What were you wanting to do? Uh, I found that the closest thing I could get to what matched my passions was trial work. So I nurtured that skill all throughout law school. So I was part of the trial team and we had one of the top 10 trial teams in the country. So we were regularly winning national competitions. And that was 40 hours of my week alone dedicated oh to goodness. trial team practice. Uh, on top of that, I worked for the U.S. Attorney's Office. I worked for the Governor's Office on executive pardons. I worked for a uh, a judge, a felony trial court judge the year after I graduated for a year working on trials. So trial work was something that really interested me because that was where the strongest element of storytelling came out. That was where, you know, I'm going to stand in front of a jury. And by the time we're done, you're going to believe that my story is the most convincing story out yeah. of all the stories that you've heard here in the courtroom. And so I really enjoyed it. I got a thrill out of it, whereas most other attorneys avoid going to trial. Because they, right. a trial is a toss up. You never know what's going to happen. You can't predict how humans are going to vote in the, you know, when they go back into their jury room. And I had a year of access to that where I saw what jury people are commenting on as I'm walking them back and forth. What are the things that they're saying? You know, what are they focusing on? What really stood out in the trial for them? I've never been scared of a trial because I can tell a good story. And that <laughs> made me a good lawyer. Yeah. And and are you speaking from mostly the viewpoint of the prosecution in these cases? Yes. Uh, and so I did work in the criminal trial basis for a while before I switched over to doing civil work. So I worked for a social security disability law firm for two years and I handled hundreds of cases with them uh, before switching over to working at a nonprofit on contract law, where I was also handling a high caseload. So by the time I was done in five years that I practiced, I handled over 700 cases where I was the attorney of record. That's amazing. And, and, and I kind of going down this path again, because of my, my daughter wants to kind of get, get into um, 
uh, to be a prosecutor, essentially. So, and she edits my podcast, so she will be listening to this and be like, "That that woman was so cool. That's exactly what I want to do." Yes, I think uh, I'm actually grateful that it didn't work out well for me with that with law that I didn't stay in that area. I think it was meant to be because I think that that was something that I really wanted to do. And being a prosecutor is heavy work because you really take on the responsibility of wanting to see justice get served. If something doesn't happen, which again is completely out of your control with so many other elements in a trial, you can really feel, you know, you can take on a lot of that guilt. So it's a tough job and I have a lot of respect for the people who do it. And I'm grateful that my path led me to where I am now, where I feel like I can equally use my storytelling abilities in a way that isn't so emotionally taxing on me and in a way that I can, you know, do so in an uplifting, non-adversarial setting. Right. And you and I'm, I was just thinking the same thing. And I think about this a lot with journalists as well, who transition to become novelists, for example, like that training to basically make an argument to say, here, are, here's here are the facts within this story. And how can I present them in the way that is the most compelling, the most concise in a way, because because you, you have to keep the attention of the listener or the reader and I, and I would imagine your experience in that really honed those skills for you. Absolutely. And it's what made, you know, the transition to being a journalist, which I do now as one of my freelance income streams, so natural and how I was able to make that move without any traditional journalism training. And so, so five years and then what? So then I took a year long travel challenge uh, that is the subject of my memoir, 12 Trips in 12 Months, uh, where I set out to take one trip every month while I was employed full time as an attorney uh, the year before my 30th birthday. I, you know, so sipping a mojito in Cuba on Sunday and being back in time for court on Monday morning, I ended up taking 20 trips to 41 cities across 11 countries. At the end of that year, I wrote my first book, I self published my first book on how to find affordable flights because it was the book I had inadvertently been marketing that whole year by sharing my wins and my flight, you know, purchases that I was getting. And I had also gotten a job teaching English online that year to fund my travels in the morning before work. I would teach English online from like 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. kind of thing. And then I had that job as a crutch when I quit my job at the end of the year. So so this challenge, it was just a posted challenge on social media or something like that? It was a personal challenge that I wanted to take because I had, yeah, I had myself um, just worked throughout, you know, my 20s and I had done everything that was expected of me. And now my 20s were about to be gone. And this is a big milestone birthday where you're thinking, you know, am I where I want to be? Have I achieved the things I wanted to? And I know for me, a big element that was lacking in my type A super perfectionist, like land everything life was having fun, was just enjoying myself. Letting go a little bit, yeah. yeah. And so that that was the goal of that year, to send out my 20s <laughs> in a happy way, in a, in a celebratory way, versus being anxious about what milestones I hadn't achieved yet and how I could you know, manufacture that by that deadline. So these trips, these 40 trips, so we're talking, you know, weekend getaways kind of a thing. If you're doing that all in a year, you're not you're not going away for weeks at a time to one place. Correct. Twenty trips, forty one cities. So a lot of trips oh, had multiple cities. cities. Um, but yes, definitely the longest trip was, you know, like a Fourth of July around then, where I took two vacation days and I already had four days off because they gave us 4th of July and then the Monday yeah. before off as well. So that was a six day trip that I took two days off for yeah. and I went to the South of France. But, so, but every, almost like most weekends you are going somewhere while um, working. <laughs> yes. And I mean, I, and I was still traveling. So the idea was just like one big trip a month. And so I went, you know, into a volcano in Iceland. I swung off the edge of the world in Ecuador. I volunteered with elephants in Thailand. I swam with sea turtles in Aruba. So if it's a Europe flight, a Caribbean flight, a South American flight, I'm on the East coast. I can get there mostly overnight. Like that's pretty easy. Yeah. Um, the, the, and I had the energy to just land and go straight into a trip and, you know, land and go straight back to work. So, uh, it was an exhausting year and I don't know that at 36, I could do this now. Um, definitely and an expensive not. year, I would think. Which is why that second job was so crucial. So that's why when people ask me like all of that money I was making, I was 
another reason I was exhausted, but I was really teaching as much as I could making $20 an hour for, you know, every round of two classes that I taught. And so I would make like 1500 a month or so extra doing that. And that's what yeah. I use as my budget for the trips. Oh, okay. Well, that's very smart. Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, you know, we've talked a little bit about how your background in law kind of prepared you to be um, a writer, but what also prepares you to be a writer is exposure to the world, which is what you did, right? So be, because you climb out of the ignorance of being in one place all the time, who, that, and that makes a really poor writer, typically, <laughs> to somebody who has all these experiences from all these different cultures, whether you write about that directly or not, and I know you do, obviously, but if you were writing a novel, for example, just you're basically developing your natural empathy, I think, by all of that exposure to, to other people. Um, how, how do you think that affected your ability to communicate what you were seeing? Do you feel like you've become more empathetic over time? You've, you, you have a greater understanding of the world at large? Yeah, I mean, I'm constantly learning things that I had no idea I didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I was starting, I didn't know things like about ethical animal practices. So I didn't know that you shouldn't be swimming with dolphins and you shouldn't be riding elephants. You know, like I didn't know all of these things. Um, and I didn't know that we had a, a whole industry driving that ourselves. Um, you know, now as we've gotten more in the field, I'm scrutinized a lot for my actions. So I have to be very careful about the things that I share, how I label, you know, indigenous cultures, you know, how I share accents, like everything runs by a sensitivity read with me. At least in this latest book, we had definitely sensitive Activity reads going on to make sure that we were being cognizant and thoughtful with, with regards to other people's cultures. So I think that there is always that element. And that makes it so that you do want to be a little bit more careful about how you share. And things change too, like how you name things, how you can, you know, refer to sure. things changes over time. So I myself had to go back and like try to rewrite articles that I've written for major publications. And normally they don't allow edits for those. But if I can pitch, you know, this is not using the correct terminology anymore, this needs an update, like I can usually get that pass to be able to make an update even like, you know, six or 10 years later now. Um, but it's wow. something I'm always cognizant of. Yeah, like what in my past and what kind of portfolio material is out there? And how is it representing people? Because it has to do so in an accurate and respectful way. And that's yeah. definitely a lot of pressure. So just to make sure I understand, say you wrote an article for the Washington Post a decade ago they could potentially entertain the idea of updating it, even though it's an archived article. If it's still live on the site, yes. So an example of that is I wrote about uh, indigenous tribes. And at the time, Native American was more of a popular term than it is now where it's more first Americans, indigenous, things of the sort. Uh, and so that wasn't really the right terminology to be using. And so I did approach yeah. this one magazine to ask to be able to update that. And they actually said it was on their list to go through an update. Oh, so I think they have an yeah. internal thing as well. Right. Because, you know, to your point, things change all the time. And it's, you know, the backlog of <laughs> things that, you know, we're not going to say anymore to, to catch up with that would be an almost impossible task. So it just surprised me that that was, I didn't know that that was the thing. So that's really interesting. But even, so let's talk about sensitivity readers for a second, because we've, we've touched on that from time to time on this show. Um, and it's fascinating to me. And I think it's a necessary thing when you're doing something like a travel blog where, so a good example would be if you're writing from a first American point of view, and that's your novel or whatever. And, and maybe that's not who you are, um, which <laughs> that probably wouldn't happen. But for example, they would have a sensitivity reader who's, who represents whatever community, right? But when you're writing a travel blog, which you might have a, a book that encompasses 30 different cultures, are they choosing people from each one of those cultures to read that? Like how, who's, who is the authority? <laughs> is it one person who just knows everything? <laughs> Well, I think with my publishing company, particularly, they had a team of people. So it ran through multiple people, ideally, because every person has a different lens and a different way that they're looking at things. I might look at things from a heightened sensitivity of a Latino perspective, whereas somebody else might look at it, you know, somebody mentioned that me mentioning that women 
I, initially I had to write that women were not great at push-ups because of our weight being distributed differently. So that like our weight, our center of gravity and our weight for carrying children is like in our pelvis and our legs, yeah. not so much in our arms. And then that was like discriminatory potentially to women without, yeah. you know, who had strong arms. And so, and I didn't mean for that to be the case. I thought I'm just stating, you know, the way that women's right. weight is distributed versus men. And that was something that one particular reader caught presumably because um, she probably had really jacked arms. And was <laughs> right. like, you know, yeah. and so I, you know, so it runs through multiple people to see what each person's going to filter and catch. I think. Right. But I think the key of it is, and this is my opinion, is that, and I think it's true with whether it's a sensitivity read or just somebody who's giving you feedback on your writing, it's great to have a lot of people to listen to, but you don't need to listen to all of them. Because if, if you know what I mean? Like if one person has an issue with it and you understand the issue, you get that, but you do feel like maybe that's an outlier are you really going to change everything for that one comment out of 50 that you got that it, i mean it's an existential problem right because you never know who is going to take umbrage with what and you and you truly don't want to be um, um offensive to anybody but you can also water something so far down that it's it, it just loses kind of the mean because your example is really interesting to me for it because that's a, a physiological you know, probably factual you know, truism, which I mean, makes sense to me. I hadn't heard that before, but it makes sense to me. So that feels like it, it's totally fine to write. But like, to your point, one person's like, Hey, this is really and I'm like, and I get that point of view, too. So it's like, where do you? It's the age old, where do you draw the line? And, and in my case, I, you know, I, I listen to the experts, I listen to my editors. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily listen to like, one reviewer, you know, out of a thousand. Um, so yeah, but it, but it still stings if you feel like that person's upset with what you wrote. So and it's, this, it's was, this is internal. This is not reviewers. Reviewers, right, I don't right, even right, read right. I because understand. It, it's going to be you can't even look at those. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, I don't, we don't even touch those. That's like the third rail, right? Uh, and so, but internally, somebody mentioned that, and so I think the the line for me because I totally agree, and so that was something I asked myself: How important is it to push back on this? And right. so I used that example because I thought it was seemingly benign and something that I didn't even think would be an issue. And it was so easily fixed by just saying like many women, you know, versus all. And that's something where, you know, if yeah, my yeah, background, right. I know that absolutes can trigger people. So just saying many, most, some, you know, that can really just lessen the impact of something that wasn't crucial to the story. But in, right. in another instance, for instance, I have taken writing classes before with one of my mentors and, and one of the best travel writers I know. And he has mentioned, you know, writing true to the accent of the person that you're listening to as a way to bring that character to life, as a way to, you know, take that person to the destination, if that means, and, you know, and I had some pushback on that where they were like, I don't know if we like the way that that accent is written. And I was like, but I'm going to leave it like that because that's how it's pronounced. And that's how I'm, I'm hearing the person talk. And it's not meant to be any kind of, it's not meant to be indicative at all of value on the accent or anything like that. It's just meant to be a straightforward rendition of what I heard. And it also adds variety to the text when you're, when you can hear the accent of people talking versus just everybody talking in like basic, perfect English, you know? Right, right. No, you make a great point. And it's, you know, for the listeners out there, it's just something we deal with quite a bit. And you, and again, I'm going to use a novel example just because that's what I write, but you might have a character who's got their views <laughs> and those views might be totally offensive, um, con conventionally offensive. Um, but that's who that character is just as there are people like that. And so technically that should be off limits, but you still have to be thoughtful about it. Um, or even if you use, you know, I've written stuff that, you know, takes place, you know, decades and decades ago, and they might use a, a slur that was commonly used back then that you would not use today. But it was absolutely of that time, even though it was written, you know, in, in modern usage. I, I just had this conversation with um, a well known romance writer, and she writes historical romances, she made a really interesting comment about how you know, you might be writing a romance set in the 18th century where you just know, you know the men were awful. Mm -hmm. And 
but but if if it's the pro, not if it's the main say love interest the main guy love interest he can't be like that he has to be kind of has have modern sensibilities even though it probably doesn't make a lot of sense for that time period and that's just it's just fascinating to me because that is such a balance and you you i think as a writer you always want to be true your your instinct is to be true to the voice true to the representation of whoever that person is sure. <laughs> whoever they are and and to pull away from that just feels phony but I get it. <laughs> so I, you know, that's why sometimes it's best to, to listen to editorial teams and things like that. So, Absolutely. and, and, and choosing your battles because you as the writer have the right to say, no, leave it as it is. This is, this compromises my vision. If you change this other things like your, your example about the pushups, this is not the hill I'm going to die on. This is no right. big deal. Exactly. Change it from all to many. It's, and most of the times that is the solution is it's a small change um, and it doesn't really af affect the story, but it's, it's, it's more and more pervasive. And I see it when we get to um, uh, co um, copy editing sensitivities about even I, another good example. I, I learned, and sorry, I'm rambling about this, but oh. I, I had a manuscript where I did have phrases in Spanish here and there um, mixed with English. And then I would, my, 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 my tendency was to italicize the Spanish. That was a problem. And that was so interesting to me to find out that that was, I mean, not a huge problem. Um, but the reasoning being is that you are making this into kind of a secondary language by italicizing it. And I'd grown up always seeing, you know, mm -hmm. non-English <laughs> in an English book Correct. being italicized. So I learned something. But but I never I never I don't think in a thousand years would have come to that conclusion on my own. Um, so you know, I don't know I don't know what the point is except that we're constantly in a state of learning. And that that's the benefit, right, of having a team and of being traditionally published. Because I am somebody who switched from self-published to having a team, and it was different to have that oversight, to have so many reviews. You know what I think is the review and we're done editing it's just the first review of many reviews that they're lined up and I had no idea and so yeah, I yeah. think that it's um, a different process but it's good to have that oversight and that team that's helping you really polish this into the best that it can be and when the publishing company is on your side and you have the same goal right of making that book really stand out and really sell well um, right. then everybody's on the same on the same page yeah yeah hopefully I mean and, and all of that process also differs from publisher to publisher because you'll hear stories from one publisher to another. Um, yeah, I mean, a typical manuscript for me probably goes through, you know, eight, eight full edits, you know, starting from your editor who's like massive edits down to the final like proofreading um, and, and all the steps in between that. And, 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 I, and it's very easy, I think, for a writer, for an author to feel like they're the employee. And so just to accept and, and and that's a hard thing to kind of overcome a little bit it is to to find the agency to push back when you really feel like it needs or have a conversation if you feel like a conversation rather than just saying yep that's totally fine um sometimes i'll get into that with certain you know i, I might use very strong language and and certain words trigger my editor and she'll be like do we have to use this word and i'm like this word is so specific to this character mm -hmm. but then i'll look at it i'm like yeah in this instance it doesn't change anything if we don't include this word so i'm totally fine with that yeah. um or you realize like the culture speaking that word says that word all the time and it's totally accepted in their culture whereas here it's more offensive um so yeah it's it, it's it also kind of makes you a little bit scared as a writer sometimes when you sit down to be like i want to write this and you think can i write this is this going to be a problem uh and and i don't know if you've ever not written anything because you feel like i don't feel like i'm the right person to represent the story well, I am constantly putting myself through filters and can I do this? And I have had brands push back on content that I create on social media. So I feel like my voice on social media is very curated. And the point of writing a memoir was to be able to 
speak in my own voice, unfiltered and tell my own experience. And so while I think it's been polished and I think it's been, you know, refined to really be the best version of what it is, it is my true voice in there in a way that I didn't feel the need to be censored on my short form public facing content, because not everybody's going to be a hundred pages deep into my memoir. Like that's going to require somebody to really like delve into wanting to know, you know, this yeah. journey. And yeah. so I feel more comfortable be myself in that long form content. Whereas I am very careful about what I put up on my 60 second video clips because you get judged so harshly and mm. it really does impact you. I feel like people who are reading, and I mean, people who read memoirs, um, I think, again, this is why I stay away from reviews because it is personal and it is people, yeah. you know, commenting about your life and right. all of my friends that have written memoirs, wildly successful memoirs have equally have had, you know, really divisive reviews on it. And so you, I stay away from it. What's important to me is like, have I executed what I wanted to in launching this book? I had goals for a media tour. I had goals for a book tour. And so my, I just stay blind, you know, blind with put the blinders on and only look at what do I need to do and what do I need to perform? Not, you know, necessarily how is it being received other than the people who are there to meet me face to face at these events and, you know, flooding me with all kinds of compliments and feel good things. Because I think as an author, your stuff is open to dissection by everyone. And as an influencer, I am constantly, constantly receiving unwanted feedback from people that is usually very nasty. And so yeah. I have to insulate myself from these things to be able to just do my job and keep creating. I cannot take the opinion of hundreds of thousands of people into my Yeah, head. no, for sure. For sure. I mean, and, and, and it is interesting because it all speaks to also what you are writing because it strikes me as what you are writing, as you, you know, as you've said, you are the point of view. You're not creating a character who then has their own thoughts. And it's all from you. So as long as you're being true to yourself, you're, you know, including all your flaws, you know, what's there to argue against. You might not like it, but you can't say, you know, this person um, is co-opting a, a culture other than their own. Like, no, I traveled here and this is what I witnessed. And I might have some ignorance in my viewpoints or whatever, but this is, this is my filter and how I saw it. So you, as long as you're pure and honest, you can't go wrong. But that, you know, the other side of that whole coin is that you are so prolific on social media where it's the nastiest of the nasty. Um, you know, as beautiful as a lot of people are on social media, you will, you know, get tenfold times nasty comments just because humans by and large suck. Uh, that's got to be I, probably at first that was probably really hurtful. And then you just like, like you said, you put the blinders on. It's like, okay, I know that that exists and that's not going away. That's not what's driving my sales. Yeah, absolutely. You really cannot because, you know, everybody's going to have an opinion. Everybody's going to say really mean and hurtful things. And if you let that stop you, you're never going to get anywhere. So I've learned in social media, this is my business. I'm getting paid to post here. I'm getting paid. This is for my brand. This is not for fun. I spend hours a day on social media and it's not scrolling for like, you know, my enjoyment. It is all right. You're work. creating. Yeah, yes. Right. I'm, this, I'm the constantly. same way. I don't ever scroll. I just post. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And if I am, it's, you know, on threads to look at something to Res respond to because I think again that that's going to get the engagement that I'm looking for you know things like that so everything that I'm doing on social media is very targeted it's very for a reason and it's not for fun what I do for fun is not travel and not be on my phone right. because right. be at home <laughs> right. yeah just right. like be in my house like yeah exactly be in pajamas lounge read things like actual physical books um and so I I just do this because it's, it's, it's work. And I think that makes it easier when you're getting paid to deal with it, when right. you know that it's, a, you know, actually you are, you know, the product online, it becomes easier. But it, and, and this is probably, this might be the deepest in any interview I've ever have uh, dived into talking about, you know, cultural sensitivities and comments and, and social media. But I'm just curious because it's not like, it's not like you're a New York Times opinion writer where you know it's the, you know, I know I'm pissing off half the population from what I'm, what is it like? Why? And this is a very ignorant question. And, but it, it just strikes me as like, why, 
what are people's problems? Like, what are you writing about where people are so upset? Um, you know, are there things that you read like, I can't believe anyone has a problem with this, much less to the degree that they seem to have a problem with it? Yes, people will find a problem with anything. <laughs> it does not matter. You could post rainbows and butterflies and they would be like, that rainbow is acid rain and that is butterfly mistreatment. <laughs> like they really would. Like it does not matter what you post. Um, they are just, they they find a way to make everything horrible. Um, and, and I've had some instances where it's just really like unexpected and something just hit. Like, I mean, so many things come off the top of my head, um, but just well, misogyny is usually the first one. And it doesn't matter what you're writing. It could be like you said, it could be a poem. And, you know, because I've talked to plenty of female authors who are just like, I won't even go to Goodreads because they're so hateful. And, you know, a, a male counterpart writing the exact same book doesn't have all those comments. And it's just, it just is mind boggling. And that was the initial impetus for my book to begin with, right? That at 30, all of a sudden as a woman, if you're single and you're not married and you don't have children, you're looked at as damaged goods and what's wrong with you. And, you know, and mm. now at 36 where I'm similar, like so many people, that's their first attack um, of just like, you're either you're fat, you're ugly, you're dumb, you know, you're gonna die alone, you're a cat lady, things like and people just do all and that's just like the light end. my friend, who has a bigger account, she gets to, like, so, like told to kill herself, like she gets told all the time, like, just horrible I just things. can't even wrap my head around that. It's really wild. I don't know why people are very emboldened. Things bring out anger in people and it doesn't matter what you post, you will get that, particularly going viral. That's why going yeah. viral is not a gift because you know, <laughs> it's not like right, yeah. thousands of people see your stuff. Great. It's your friends, your family, people with tangential interests. When it gets to the millions of people seeing your stuff, it doesn't matter. They don't care about your stuff. They just care about ways to cut you down. And yeah. once you once you start getting where you're like, okay, this went from everybody agreeing with me to now the disagreements and the people, you know, really poking at me are coming in, that means your content's going viral, which unless you're selling something with that video to make it worth the headaches and like the stuff that you're putting up with and in inputting all of this negative constant information into your head day after day, do you know what it is to have to fight that like to hear yeah. all of those negative things you have to say for every negative thing you input, you have to say to yourself, like, no, I'm this, I'm that. Like, you have to really physically fight that stimuli that you're entering every single day of, of negative things, of insults, of personal degrading cut downs. Um, yeah. yeah. So when my we, video we, just performs okay, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and I'm sure part of that is also, you know, to your earlier point, I just don't even look anymore. Like I, I, you know, which, which is a shame because then you're not seeing the, all the great things people are saying as well. Um, but it's, yeah. And I know it's an easy thing to say, but I think it's absolutely true. It's just how miserable these people must be that, you know, because they don't even, they probably don't even remember <laughs> commenting on your video because they're spending as much time as you're spending on social media, they're spending twice the amount of time going from account to account, just writing miserable things because they're, they're sitting at home watching some awful news program all day. And then they're just constantly like in the state that they're in that state of negativity that you're, you're trying to escape from. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely do not recommend social media when you're like at a rough time in life. I had a, <laughs> uh, I, I, my sequel, I'm working on the sequel now and it's about another 12 trips and 12 months challenge that I took last year after my 35th birthday after I, my boyfriend of two years dumped me on a sponsored cruise on my birthday, the same oh day my, my Facebook account was hacked. Oh. And so I was like at a really low point. Yeah, so it's a low point. Have, to have somebody be, you know, and I, my friends took me to Harry Potter World here in Orlando because I like Harry Potter and it cheers me up, like to just be playful and to be in, you know, like a kind of childish state for a little bit and to turn off your worries. And I'll never forget, like the first weight comment that I got because I did put on, you know, breakup weight um, was like, looks like you've had too many butter beers, like you should cut down on that. And like those words, like those really horrible comments get seared into your brain. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. You're right. You, it doesn't matter. Like I remember all of them when I first started posting on TikTok about making the transition. Some like little 16 year old brat was like, my dad says <laughs> law is not for everyone. And I was like, 
<laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and I remember all these stupid comments. Yeah, I no, I would be too. now, but <laughs> it's just funny. Yeah. And I know in myself, I'm, you know, I can be sensitive, like, like, not in the sense that it will ruin my day, but I, I think like you, I would remember years later, you know, nasty comments that came out of left field. And it's like, well, you know, cause I'll read one star reviews of my book, which is, which can be entertaining. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's easier, I think for someone like me, because I'm not writing about myself. So right. they're not commenting on me as a person. They're commenting on my story. Um, right. and you know, does and that still doesn't obviously feel great. So I can't imagine what it's <laughs> like <laughs> when it's, it's literally you that they're oh, just people fucking suck. They just do. Um, so, so how is your, how is your writing your actual physical act of writing, the way that you, you know, you obviously have a great muscle for it. How has it changed? Have you seen a change over the years as you've produced these books, writing about, you know, sell things from your perspective? Do you feel like your voice has gotten more distinct, more pronounced? Um, has it gotten easier to physically write? <laughs> I think it was a challenge to switch from writing general nonfiction how to advice books to writing a story. And it's something that I've done in the past, but I've done it in a short form way, like articles. I can do, yeah. a, you know, 2000 word article on this story where it has a really nice tie in in the beginning, a really like great takeaway at the end. It's witty and you can do all of that for 2000 words. Now you try to multiply that uh, right. by. Like, right. By like 30 and all of a sudden they're like, oh, this all has to be cohesive. And I have such respect for authors that, you know, can like leave these little gems like early on in a book and then try tie it in like six books later where you're like, oh, that's why that yeah. was brought up. Like to me, that level of planning just blows my mind and I have such an appreciation for it. I think even with a memoir, I knew overarching what I was going to be telling, but it was my story. So I already know where it's going. I know what all the gems are. Like I know how this is going to be laid out. Um, versus like world making and having to make a world, which I, I just think is so impressive and I have so much respect for. Yeah, it's not easy. But I mean, so in my case, for example, I don't outline. So I just write what's in my head and I don't look back. And and then so your draft is a complete mess. Yes. Um, but you start to realize things. And when you realize, oh, there's this thing that happens three quarters of the way through, then you start going back and dropping those gems in to, to tie into it. So it's, but it's, it's a process, yeah. no matter what you do, it all, it's all about the editing and it, and it's interesting to me. I, I, I coached a person once who was writing a memoir and it was a fascinating process because with memoirs, there's so many people who want to write memoirs. Like, you know, everyone wants to write a memoir. Most people don't have anything interesting enough to say. Um, that's the sad reality of it. I mean, everyone's interesting. Everyone's got stories, but to say like, I want to write a, you know, a 400 page memoir. It's like, okay, is this a memoir or is this you needing to write to work through your own stuff, which is valid, totally valid too. But that doesn't mean it's going to be interesting to the world at large. Um, so you do have to treat a memoir as you would a mystery or a thriller or women's fiction. It's got to, it's got to be compelling. You've got to care about the character. There's got to be a real story there. It can't just be that yeah, this happened to me and this was a challenge and here's how I try to deal with it. Um, the, the reader wants to go through. So do you think about that? Do you think about, you know, clearly it's your story and these things happened, but you have to have the ob objectivity to say, yeah, this was interesting to me. I'm not sure this part's going to be interesting to my editor. Yeah, absolutely. So I did work with a memoir coach. Uh, and so that was something I was doing even before I started querying Smart. was really um, figuring out. So she out, she laid out the differences between memoir and biography as memoir being a specific time in your life that shows a universal lesson. So for instance, um, in the travel round, because that's what I think of, Cheryl Strayed, she hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. There's a start and an end time. And the story is about that particular challenge. You know, Elizabeth Gilbert, she went on that one year sabbatical, start and time. And it's about what she learned and how she was transformed through that challenge, where that's universally applicable. Whereas a biography 
or, you know, that's more, tell me who pushed you in the second grade because I care enough to know Michelle Obama uh, and I will be angry for yeah. you, right? Like, yeah, yeah, if you right. have to- <laughs> Right, and how did that form who exactly. you turned out to be later on? Exactly, and so one is because people care about you and just wanna know all about you, and the other one really has to be about the universal themes that you're gonna explore there. And so for me, those universal themes, I knew, you know, once we had that clear and I'm working through these modules, I knew that those themes included, you know, being single approaching 30, you know, the pressures that women face to have it all in society and how we're judged if we don't meet those milestones by a certain time, the universal uh, feeling of have I reached where I want to be by these milestone birthdays, because birthdays are a time of reckoning that a lot of people decide that they want to do something or, you know, that they want to take more, more drastic action, particularly these you know, 30, 40, 50 birthdays, things like that. And so I wanted to tap into those themes. And, you know, we worked through what are what are the three acts of a memoir. So in the beginning, you're kind of setting up who is this person and why are they fundamentally flawed and And why else should can I care? Yeah, you can see it, but they can't see it. And <laughs> right. then leaving you in such a precipice that you at the end of that first act see that there's been so much tension that something has to change and you're invested in seeing how that changes right something big has to happen that pushes that change and then you have kind of the metamorphosis where you probably realize that what you tried or what you thought was going to work didn't uh and then what are the lessons that you're learning throughout like kind of the bulk of the story and then at the end really bringing it back and now being that fully transformed person where you see your shortcomings and you see how this journey has changed you. And ideally somebody's following that journey along with you thinking yeah. that they can be changed or inspired to do something similar. Right. And noting that like, yeah, right. And in a perfect world, meaning in fiction where you can just make up whatever you want to make up, you still have to try and fail all those things because you can't succeed unless you've had those failures. Like that's so, I mean, that's, I can evidence that in my own life. Like I only succeed in things after I've usually failed because that allows you to try it in a different way. But it, it, it also strikes me with a memoir that like you, I, I think to your point, um, how did I change through this as a person? Cause you want readers want closure, some kind of closure, whatever they're reading. And w what do you do if, what you're writing about, you didn't really change. <laughs> you went through, like, what if you went through all of this and you didn't really change, but you still had all these experiences. Is that a satisfying conclusion to a memoir? And so I think a lot of people, when they read my book, expect there to be an ending where I found a guy and I got married and it's happily ever after. You know, even when we were talking to writers. But then they're not getting it, I feel like, right? Like, exactly. That, that doesn't seem that, like that would be the point of this is I'm traveling to find a husband. I'm traveling to just, you know, it's almost a, a quest of self actualization and has nothing to do with <laughs> the opposite sex. But that's not how it's been presented to us because we want stories to be wrapped up with a nice little bow. And yeah. so when people were looking at writing this to potentially pitch it for a script, they had like a whole thing. Oh, that God. They built I can only imagine. <laughs> You know, like, you know, because they want right. it to be in a nice little bow at the end of everything. And I was just like, but it's not. It's not right. that. And it's, it doesn't feel authentic to the story because first you've written the ending that I'm still living. Like, I, I know the sequel <laughs> now, <laughs> right. but I don't know where this ending is going. And it's probably going to be better than anything that could be written. Stick with me on this character development. Right, it's right, right, some right. Time, <laughs> But it's worth the investment. And so... I think this was the first book. I think this not this last year and the development that I've done this last year of doubling down at 35, being dumped by a boyfriend of two years who I thought was going to propose and really having to deal now with those same recurring themes. Like you're mentioning, you know, I didn't just become my fully actualized self at the end of that last book. I turned 30 and boom, I am now the person I was meant to be. I have fully solved everything and I'm like super right. perfect. Like it is an You're ongoing... simply not the person who you were. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm more aware of the things that I need to work on. And in this, you know, this sequel I'm working on now, it'll be doubling down on those lessons and how much you've grown in the five years through travel and all the things that I've seen. Yeah. But, but it's an ongoing journey. Interesting. Well, Jen, it's been fascinating talking to you. Before we wrap up, we're going to do a quick storytelling, as I mentioned earlier. 
Um, it's the making it up portion of the show. So we're going to choose a random book from the bookshelves behind me, a random sentence from a random page. I'm going to read that sentence, and then that'll be the first sentence in maybe like a two-minute long short story. So I'll read the sentence. You give me the next sentence or two of what you think happens. I'll do a sentence or two, and then we'll kill it when it goes off the rails. Um, so give me a color of a book that I can choose. Uh, red. Okay. Everyone chooses red. It's amazing. It's a really foreground color in your bookshelf. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Um, all right. So <laughs> this is, geez, this is a 1200 page book <laughs> called uh, The Children's War uh, by J.N. Uh, Stroyar. Um, so give me a page between one and 1100. <laughs> 58. Okay. Uh, so I am just going to quickly scan 58 um, to see if there's a sentence like that would be good here. Um, all right. <laughs> I'm going to read this and then you do whatever you want with it. Or if you want me to go first, I can too. But um, here's the sentence. After a few minutes, he used a knife and cut the rope off. He wasn't sure if it was the right move, but he was going to trust his gut. He held the rope in such a way that it made it look to the guards that he was still tied. He had to wait for the perfect moment of opportunity. They clearly didn't see the knife either. That was going to be key to the next few seconds. It was a good thing Jackie had given him the knife when she came and visited earlier that day. <laughs> he spent two seconds thinking about it, thinking about the fact that he really only had two years left to serve. Murder would keep him here for life, if not send him to the death, death penalty. He had to figure out what to do and figure it out quickly. With Jackie running through his head, he found his opportunity and made his move, leaping from the chair and out beyond the sight of the guard right before he turned around. He thought he was free, but when he turned around, he had forgotten that there was one other prisoner there who ran out after him, a friend of his, really, but he could not let his friend get in his way right now. He looked down at the knife in his hand. He decided for Jackie and for their unborn baby, he had to leave his friend behind. And so he tossed the knife towards his friend direction and booked it for the door. <laughs> I think we'll call it there. That's great. That was very, see, that was very hopeful. That had a nice conclusion to it. There was no killing involved. <laughs> I'm like, I, in my, and, and what, I, what I love about that exercise, and I say this almost every episode, is that it, it, it's improv, right? So it forces you to accept the premise of whoever you're doing this with. So in my mind, there was going to be blood within seconds. In your <laughs> mind, you're like, no, 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 you, you, no one has to die. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Let's ninja our way out of here. <laughs> right, let's ninja our way out of here. It doesn't all have to be about death and destruction, Carter. <laughs> Well, Jen, it was great talking to you. You were you were a fascinating conversationalist. I, you know, it's just interesting because we did go deep into a couple of things that I don't normally go deep on. So I think that's going to be great for the listeners. And I feel like I, I learned a lot from you today. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Carter. Likewise, I had a lot of fun. All right, take care. So that's it. That is my conversation with uh, Jen Ruiz. That was fascinating. Um, like I said early on, I feel like I learned from her. So um, really, really good conversation. If you want to follow her, um, you can just head on over to Instagram to Jen on a jet plane um, and follow her there. And then you can read all about her as well. And if you want to check out my books, check out my newsletter, my blogs, all that kind of stuff, um, please head on over to carterwilson.com. Or if you're interested in my online classes, uh, my retreat treats or my one-on-one -on -one coaching, please check out unboundwriter.com. That's it, everyone. Thanks so much, as always, for watching and or listening. Another episode of Making It Up will be out just next week. In the meantime, take care.